In 256, the Romans sent a fleet of no less than 330 ships from Sicily to Africa, where the army aboard was supposed to strike at the Carthaginian homeland. Before crossing the Mediterranean, it encountered a Carthaginian navy of over 350 ships at Echnomus, an early 3rd century city founded by refugees from Jela. The fight at Echnomus was to be one of the greatest battles in history, because both sides sent more than 140,000 men to sea. And today, we'll be taking a look at this battle. Both sides thought that they fought now on equal terms, and both threw themselves most thoroughly into the task of organizing naval forces and disputing the command of the sea. While in the meantime, the land forces accomplished nothing worthy of mention, but spent their time in minor operations of no significance. The Romans, therefore, after making preparations for the coming summer, set to the sea with a fleet of 330 deck ships of war and put into Messina. Starting again from there, they sailed with Sicily on their right hand, and doubling Cape Picanus, they came around to Ignomus. Because their land forces too happened to be just in that neighborhood, the Carthaginians setting sail with 350 deck vessels touched at Lilibaeum, and proceeding thence came to the anchor at Hericula Manoa. The plans of the Romans was to sail to Africa and deflect the war to that country, so that the Carthaginians might fight no longer Sicily but themselves in their own territory in danger. The Carthaginians were resolved on just one opposite course, for, aware as they were that Africa is easily accessible and that all the people in that country would be easily subdued by anyone who had once invaded it, they were unable to allow this and were anxious to run the risk of a sea battle. The object of one side being to prevent that and the other to force a crossing, it was clear that their rival aims would result in a struggle which followed. The Romans had made suitable preparations for both contingencies, for an action at sea and for landing in the enemy's country. The whole body embarked on the ships numbered about 140,000 each, holding 300 rowers, 120 marines. The Carthaginians were chiefly or solely adapting their preparations for a maritime war their numbers being, to reckon by the number of ships, actually above 150,000. These are fighters calculated to strike not only one present with the forces under his eyes, but even our hearer with amazement at the magnitude of the struggle and at the lavish outlay and vast power of the two states, if he estimates them from the number of men and ships. The Romans taking into consideration that the voyage across the sea was open water and the enemy was far superior in their speed tried by every means to range their fleet in an order which render it secure and difficult to attack. Accordingly, they stationed their two six-bank galleys on which the consuls, Marcus Attilus Regulus and Lucius Manilus, were sailing in front and side by side with each other. Behind each of these placed ships in a single file, the first squadron behind the one galley, the second behind the other, so arranging them at a distance, each pair of ships in the two squadrons grew even larger. Having thus arranged the first and second squadrons in the form of a simple wedge, they stationed the third in a single line at the base, so that when these ships had taken their place, the resulting form of the whole was a triangle. Behind these ships at the base, they stationed the horse transports, attaching them by rowing tights to the vessels of the third squadron. Finally, behind these were stationed the fourth squadron, known as Triarii, making a single long line of ships to extend that line overlapped that in front of it at each extremity. When all had been put together in the manner, the whole arrangement had the form of a wedge, the apex of which was open, the base compact, and the whole effective and practical, while also difficult to break up. About the same, the Carthaginian commanders briefly addressed their forces. They pointed out to them that in every event of victory in the battle, they would be fighting afterwards for Sicily, but if defeated, they would have to fight for their own country and their homes, and bade them this to heart and embark. When all readily did as they were ordered, as their general's words had made clear to them the issues at stake, they set the sea in a confident and menacing spirit. The commanders, when they saw the enemy's order, adapted their own to it. Three quarters of their force drew up in a single line, extending their own right to the open sea for the purpose of encircling the enemy, and with all their ships facing to the Romans, the remaining quarter of the force formed the left wing of their whole line, and reached shoreward at angle with the rest. Their right wing was under the command of Hanno, who had been worsened in the engagement near Agrigentum. He had vessels for charging and also the swiftest quinquiriums for the outflanking movement. The left wing was in charge of Hamilcar, the one who commanded in sea battle at Tenirdis, and he, 
fighting as he was in the center of the line, using the fray following stratagem. The battle was begun by the Romans, noticing that the Carthaginian line was thin owing to its great extent, delivered an attack on the center. The Carthaginian center had received Hamilcar's orders to fall back at once with the view of breaking the order of the Romans, and as they hastily retreated, the Romans pursued them vigorously. While the 1st and 2nd squadrons thus pressed them on the flying enemy, the 3rd and 4th were separated from them, the 3rd squadron towing the horse transports, and the Triarii remaining with them as a supporting force. When the Carthaginians thought they had their own, and drawn off the 1st and 2nd squadrons far enough from the others, they all, on receiving a signal from Hamilcar's ship, turned simultaneously and attacked their pursuers. The engagement that followed was a very hot one, the superior speed of the Carthaginians enabling them to move around the enemy's flank as well as to approach easily and retire rapidly, while the Romans, relying on their sheer strength when they closed with the enemy, grappling with the ravens every ship as soon as it approached. Fighting also, as they were, under the eyes of both the consuls, who were personally taking part in the combat, had no less high hopes of success. Such then was the state of the battle in this quarter. At one and the same time, Hanno with the right wing, which had held its distance in the first attack, sailed across the open sea and fell upon the ships of the Triarii, causing them great embarrassment and distress. Meanwhile, that part of the Carthaginian force which was posted near the shore, changing their former formation and deploying into a line with their rows facing the enemy, attacked the vessels which were touring the horse transports. Letting go of their tow lines, their squadron met and engaged the enemy. Thus, the whole conflict consisted of three parts, and the three sea battles were going on at a wide distance from each other. As the respective forces were in each case equal strength owing to their own disobition at the outset, the battle was also fought on equal terms. However, in each case, things fell out as one would expect when the forces engaged are so equally matched. Those who had commenced the battle were first to be separated, for Hamilcar's division was finally forced back and took to flight. Lucius Manilus was now occupied in taking the prizes in tow, and Marcus Attilus Regulus observing the struggle in which the Triarii and horse transports were involved hastens to their assistance with such of the ships of the second squadron as they were undamaged. When he reached Hanno's division and came into conflict with it, the Triarii at once took heart though they had much the worst of it and recovered from their fighting spirit. The Carthaginians, attacked both in front and the rear, were in difficulties. Finding themselves surrounded to their surprise by the relieving force and giving way, they began to retreat out to sea. Meanwhile, both Lucius Manilus, who was by this time sailing up and observed the 3rd squadron was shut in close to the shore by the Carthaginian left wing, and Marcus Attilus Regulus, who now left the horse transports and Triaria in safety, hastened together to relieve this force, which was in grave peril. For the state of the matters was now just like a siege, and they would all evidently have been lost if the Carthaginians had not been afraid of the ravens and simply hedged them and them close to the land instead of charging apprehensively as they were coming close to quarters. The consuls, coming up rapidly and surrounding the Carthaginians, captured 50 ships with their crews, a few managing to slip out along the shore and escape. The separate encounters fell out and the result of the whole battle was in favor of the Romans. The latter lost 24 sails sunk and the Carthaginians more than 30. Not a single Roman ship with its crew fell into the enemy hands, but 64 Carthaginian ships were captured. After this, the Romans laying into a further supply of provisions, repairing the captured ships, and bestowing their men the attention which their success deserved, put to sea and sailed to Africa. <laughs>